Germany and um, I brought there lots of uh, speaking of Pesto here so I want to meet some of you people and um, so thank you very much for, for having me in this talk um, and uh, what I want to do I want to talk about Jaguar um, and I tell you what, what I mean by that in a minute and so let's just get right into it um, I will say I'm going to use a mix between slides and actually doing coding, and you'll see how that comes out later. Um, anyway, I will have the programmer of Paul. Every Haskell programmer is intimately familiar with this, the CHDI, the command line interpreter, and I guess you love it as well. Needs so, and you have commands and things and so on. But it's really, it's really the, the same thing with a little bit more galaxy usage. It's nothing uh, conceptually different. So you may wonder why, right? I mean, fast the program compare list and cap. Like how much <coughs> research, invention, ideas, right? into going from list to head. And all of them looked at this repo thing and said, well, let's do the same thing. Let's do this again. I mean, was it perfect? Like, this is maybe McCarthy got totally right. Like, the whole list thing, yeah, he was on to something very important, but was it really interesting guy? But the repo thing, he nailed it. So, um, standard setup, this is a list demo mode, you see how that goes. Now you have my head and the, the web presentation flow. And um, but I, I, I'm sure we'll figure it out. So I'm going to switch this over to mirroring so I can actually see what's happening here. So I've got an editor. You may have a different editor, but come on. <coughs> and um, I've got a shell. I use bag. You may use something else. But really, there's not that different. So now I could. Oh, I forgot to wipe my feet. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to talk about. So um, <coughs> let's let's start by writing a small program. But you don't want to see me type, so I just make it um, automatically. And um, so let's. And let's let's just load that up into CHDI. Uh, I should say this. So the first thing I have to say this. How do we have a say? Oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> Hold your time. Uh, I think I wanted to put plus plus here, <laughs> not plus. <laughs> it's list, right? So I, this time I'm going to remember to say. Going to go over here again. I'm going to reload this. Yeah, we are going now. Okay, so let's test this thing. So there's a tree, like a binary tree, and I've got a size function. If I give it a leaf, 
if size zero. That makes a lot of sense. Let's do something a little bit bigger. I, I bind that to, to a variable so I can reuse it. And let's just do a small pre. Um, bear with me while I can type things. Okay, what did I do? Ah, I forgot what to say this time. So let's do the size of this thing. Okay, now it doesn't even recognize the type. That wasn't expected. Um, <coughs> or, or was it? So, um, why did I do a quick tag? You should have told me that I forgot one yeah. of the, uh, no. <laughs> it's a binary tree. Mm. Okay, size of that zero. Can you read this? Zero, that tree isn't zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm, let's see. Um, you can see the point. I'm stupid, I can't write program. I, of course, I shouldn't just add the size of the two halves. For the node, I, I, I get um, no. So I reload this again, and I, 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 I just scroll this up so everyone can see. And oh, no more tree. Okay, but he's got history. That one <laughs> improvement <laughs> since this. Oh, thank you. So let's try two. Now we are done. Okay, I can write code after all. So and then I can try to convert that tree to a list and I get a list. Mm. Okay, not too bad after all, right? That feels awesome. But we knew that with a known case. So uh, let's do um, a few slides again. So we started out with this setup, which is like every Haskell programmer setup, only if you use VI or Emacs and you may <coughs> use CSP IP or CSP or whatever your favorite add-on is, and, and maybe that should be a little bit more convenient, but basically that's it. Um, what is really good enough? First of all, I mean, it was quite annoying I had to refund this tree again. I mean, I was lucky because I didn't see it, or I didn't load the system program in the meantime doing some certain system things, and that tree definition was like 200 back in my history, because then, oh uh, yeah, you know how it goes. I mean, really, not the system, kind of. It, it saves you, as you said, it saves a little bit of typing, but the system stuff is not. And what is this giant thing? Two nodes linked to CD. Okay, so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you use the editor, the predecessor of EX, which in turn is the predecessor of VI, the white code VI called VI, the V in VI is stands for visual, because CE and EX were line-based editors. Like, you type, insert line between line one and two, and this is the line I want to insert, on a command line, and then the editor inserts the stuff that you want, right? So basically, those editors were the same thing for editors as CSPI is to what? So what's VI for the <coughs> runner? Line-based interface. I mean, come on. We have two dimensions of the thing. We have one dimension of the thing. Then, oh yeah, I have to remember to say, well, it's depending on your configuration, if your editor is just type automatically. Um, maybe not. And I have to reload again, and I have to re-execute the code again. I mean, for this small example, of course, that's easy. Anything more serious kind of gets annoying. And then, well, <coughs> the thing spits out 10. This is kind <coughs> of two, but technically you can do more than 10, right? I mean, that's a very list kind, but that's still pretty awesome. So, can we do better? I mean, let's just run this this idea. What, what did VI or Emacs equivalent of a REPL was VI or Emacs was to? same example with plugins. If I find my plugins. Oh, I renew all this. 
thing again. And this time we get rid of this and get rid of that. And we open this. And then we try to detect the process. And then we call it sleep. And this is a nice piece of tool when we need to check that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, when my eye clicks, this is hot. So I don't hit my PC. So let's, let's actually do this. So we have a module trees in our data definition where <coughs> C of A equals B or uh, or uh, node of A of C of A. Why? talking about this in again because what I want to show you is that in this environment I will de develop this program differently. So that's my data definition. Okay. So and instead of trying to write any any definitions, uh, any any functions on that, let's just think about how we want to use it. So I had this example tree here, right? What was that? Node size of node leaf, leaf, and another leaf. Now this time around, if I forget the leaf, actually it does tell me if I, this is a function. So I know immediately something's gone wrong here. I didn't actually plan to do that, make that mistake uh, the first time around, but this is convenient, okay. And then um, I want the size of the leaf, the size of the tree, of course, nothing very obscure because I haven't defined size yet. So if I look at this error message, no, it's not very surprising. But that's okay. We are just thinking about what kind of code we want to execute. And um, so we've got all this. So now let's write the code. Right? So our definition of size, that was uh, a tree turned into int. So base case. Well, a leaf with size zero, right? And you see, at that point, well, the first um, query, size of leaf, returns zero size already. The other one doesn't work yet because it's just a pattern, ma pattern message here. Yeah, but who cares? So <coughs> we do the recursive call, and um, if I make the same mistake again, like I forget the plus one. I immediately see something's wrong. Well, obviously I forgot to count the node and, and I continue. There's no back and forth reloading. Why is there an error? Because I immediately see what's happening. And then I've got the second um, definition, tree of a um, flattened into a list and um, we do um, the basically same thing for leaf list and then um, we for uh, node this time we pair our elements and we put the elements in the front and um, recursively forward the size. If I make the mistake from before right then well I immediately see um, that error message and I can fix it. Okay so same example but the workflow goes slightly differently. So let's go back to the mirror display and see. Okay, so that's 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 the two-dimensional REPL, right? Everything I type into REPL, I just type it in this buffer here. And um, because why not? Because why can't the computer have me write code? All the evaluation is already done. When I type, whenever a program sends it, it evaluates because, well, maybe it will evaluate in vain. But most of the time, while you, you are editing, your computer just sits there doing nothing, right? So let it do something, which might be useful because when you look to the right and see that's wrong, you immediately know you have to fix it. So that immediately leads to more exploration because also, while you're writing the code, you're not asked. Should I start with here and try this definition already, or should I go write a few more definitions and then test them? Yeah, you, you automatically, first of all, you have a slide, you type something, you do this 
So let's do from list. So from list, 
obviously um, <coughs> a, a, a cute idea to define it instead of writing out the curtain here would be to use a fold, right? We fold over the roof to construct the pulley. Um, I don't know about you, but when I use fold, so we do know that we want to start with the leaf, right? But the combined function, I never know which order are being put together. I'm sorry, I mean, I can be like hectic like forever, but I never know. So what I can do, um, who knows about fold, fold, tight fold, you can see. So this basically, you know, so I put this underscore thing here, which basically says, well, what's the type of the thing which I have to put in here? And it tells me, okay, it's gotta be free first, then an element, and then it gives me the free. Ah, well, I could have gone back to the documentation, look up the order of arguments and fold, and yeah, sure, that's what I usually do. Um, but it kind of gets boring. So it says free first, so let's do a lambda. I want a free first and then the value, and then I have to come up with a new node because it's uh, extended free. Um, we have a leaf and uh, that subtree, which we got as the first argument. And it says, okay, now what I forgot to do here, of course, is which I should have done right away before even starting to write my code. Um, I should have called the quick start. Oh, and now it goes. But it's quick check. So let's just see what the um, problem is. So it says zero, 01, the list zero, 01 is a counter example. Well, we are here in a play playground, so let's play. So from list of that counter example is a tree. That's fine. And if I two list <laughs> this thing, then I want the same list. But that's okay. I mean, the specification here was we wanted to fold one to the other. We didn't say anything about order. So it's actually our quick check property which, um, which is not right because we want to ignore the order. So let's just sort um, both lists and then we don't care about the order. And to do this, we have to import the list to get the sorting function. And voila. Well, it says, ha, I have to re-earn my hectic programmer stripes here all the time. It's all very difficult. So that's, um, that's how we use quick check in that scenario. So you see, let's go back to keynote. But before I go back to keynote, I should just put the cursor over. Again, okay. So, so two things. First of all, this idea of starting with S and query, and then slowly kind of crafting the code um, is interesting. And secondly, the the really wacky quick check. I mean, I usually see when I'm making mistakes, but this new rule, the moment I make it, I can address it. in the feedback type, which is the text. And um, so in a sense, it's really like, usually in the best case, if you use an Emacs, you use something like Flytech or in Sublime or VI, they all these editors have uh, plugins so that you can kind of run the code in the type checker whenever you think it's a good use. So this is taking this to the next level, not only do we get type errors, <coughs> all the time, constantly, whenever we make a mistake, but we also get our text run at the same small granularity on a modern binary database. And that's, that's kind of like poor man's refinement type, right? Like, like extending the type system to have more ultra properties, things which usually not in the domain of, of static semantics. So that's interesting, right? So these listings, no 
old ladies came to sit on the car to Russian. I mean, Russian was quite invasive, but I really tried to, to explain it. And, and, and as a result of all that, yeah, I mean, even more, the raffle is great. Why is the raffle so great? It's great for beginners because you can get people to do something right away. You don't even have to write a program. You can just show them a few with this concept, this concept, right? And, and they just play around with it. So um, you can use it as a glorified calculator and, and get people into the program uh, quite rapidly. So that's great. Uh, but it's also great in for, for developers who want to quickly experiment with some code and uh, doing debugging with such and a quality function with a few parameters see what's happening. So all this is great about the raffle. And the idea here is really taking that greatness to the next level. It's not about manipulation, it's about taking it to the next level. All right. <coughs> so now is the point where I will skip this example because it's going to take too long. And it's just illustrating the same thing using Creative Suite and so on. So um, I will skip that and uh, we will go to the next thing. So the next thing is that I said, um, do you really only want text? We want to do other things. Sometimes we want to do graphics. So here's an example. Um, we recently started uh, a new tutorial, text tutorial, called Learning Headset. And it's a mix between um, kind of normal code and screen code. So a video illustrating what uh, about what you have. And um, one of the um, examples we used to illustrate the first one are these Pythagorean trees. So does anybody know those trees? One of these structural things. So the idea is quite simple. You start with the baseline. That's the red line for those who can't see it because it's low. And then you draw a square on top of that red line. And now that's where Pythagoras comes in. You um, so if that's the top line, you draw a circle on top of that, and then on that circle you pick a spot. It is going to be When I say you pick a point, is well, you're going to have some either you always pick the same angle, or you've got a funky working board that has angles, and then you put that what the green triangle here. You put that on top of that square, giving you something like that. This is the gives you the and the other two sides of that triangle are the base line for the next square, doubling the number of squares uh, in the next direction. Draw the triangle on top of that, and so on, and I show you got the idea, right? So that's quite nice. I mean, it occurs already in my experience um, with this stuff that people. I think I taught Haskell to over ten thousand people by now. I taught in Austria undergraduate courses, some of which have been taught. So recursion is the first thing where people start to say, "Okay, I'm talking about." So anything to kind of illustrate that concept is good. So these recursive graphics are a great way to, to illustrate that concept in a visual way. Okay, so let's write a program. And we have to go, now we have to pick a different happening here. I'm going to go to the very bottom. So this is the function which eventually is going to go be recursive. Um, it's not recursive yet. And it's not important 
Well, it depends on how much you talk about. That's why I introduced you to the technical summary. Basically, the first argument to refer to that, that's clear. And the other ones are really only about color, altering, and uh, kind of making this a bit more interesting than the standard pathology. So, so forget about that. Um, and then we thought recursion is pretty maybe easier yet because this SP function is our local recursive function in the end. But we, we don't call it key yet because we recursive it. So it's not recursive yet, which um, leads to And um, as you can see, we've only got one square here. That was the base we started with, right? And that's why it's not recursive. So the next thing we had to do, we had to get that triangle on top, right? And um, to get that triangle on top, um, <coughs> what I need to do is I, these points here, these four points, those are the corners of the and um, I need to add a fifth point to add the triangle, get the overall shape. So where do I get this fifth point? Well, I have to do the saturated the triangle. There would be the corner of that triangle. And I'm going to do this by um, a recursive call here, which gives me P5. What this is doing, it's basically taking the baseline, rotating it, and scaling it. And um, that would be the, 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 the corner of the triangle. Uh, we don't have to go into the definition of the rotations and so on. That's where the Pythagoras theorem comes in. Um, but um, that's really not the point here. So we put P5 in here. And um, so the thing for the little bit of a nudge now, right? Including that triangle. And um, <coughs> so the next thing that we are going to do is um, we want recursion. So we want to, um, this, this is one polygon, right? We want more polygons. Um, let's do one recursive call um, where the recursion depth is one less than it was uh, in the initial call. And then what's our new baseline? Well, the new baseline is going to be the size of the triangle, which is um, this so was the, the top of the triangle, right? So this line and that line between those two pairs of points, those are going to be the new baseline. So in the recursive call, we pass a line from P5, which is the top corner, to P3. And um, then dangerous like coding. So if these all to be um, so the picture is defined as a list of picture objects, I'll tell you that. And um, if I so now I should actually speak up. So picture is defined as a picture object. And um, ah I know I, I made this a list just for this single case, but now it's the point of view. So, and now suddenly, oh, I, this is a recursive depth here. If I bring that down to C, then this is the first, we have one corner where we added one more of these things, the base and the triangle, right? And that's one size, but we want binary recursion. So we have a second call, also one less C, but with the other side of the triangle. And um, that's right. So now we've got this one times oh, that is the wrong shape. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. You're better at this than I am. Um, so now we've got the first bit, right? So now we can. Well, we could add recursion. 
increase the return bit. Alright? So grow slowly. So that's nicer. That's quiet. That's black and white. Really? Okay. Let's add some color. As you can see, we already have some setup for this. Um, and all I've done here, I first called this helper function which does the color white. But I, the function gets as its third argument uh, an argument called color fun. This is a function which, depending on the iteration step, computes the color for that box. Then the color changes as its iteration deepens. So we will first call this function color uh, fun with the current iteration step. Then look at that. Already kind of dark, we have a brighter red, and then it goes darker. That's much nicer than the white one, I would say. And um, <coughs> another thing um, that we want to change is this is always the Picasso room at Finder. You start with a square, but it turns out if you start with a square, but you need a, a rectangle, where the base is more narrow than the height, then the, the print starts to look more organic than if you use a square. So what we are going to do, we are, and that's the comment of our code here, <coughs> we are going to extend scale the what will be the two vertical lines. Um, so we are, we set them, and then now we have to be careful, we have to change all occurrences of C3 and C4 by the prime variance. Um, no, not, it, that again was not. No, that really did uh, work really in the end. Okay. So now you see the stem is higher, but it doesn't look <coughs> like this anymore. So it fits more spaces like that. Like the real stem. Okay. So that's great. Um, what else are we missing? Um, let me see. Uh, this is small socket. So if we go to recursion depth of 80, now that has the moment to compute. Um, So what the point here, um, apart from making a pretty picture, is it's the same interaction, right? Like with the text, like with the lid, I change things, I see what's happening, I can see, ah, the stuff, like when I made this little set with C4 using C4 instead of uh, uh, C3, C4 instead of something else, and um, you saw there was this kind of mask at the side, but not the real thing you and somebody immediately said, ah, you, it's the wrong number. So you immediately <laughs> see what's happening, same as with this. Right? So that's um, one thing. So um, let me show you more. So um, we can do something similar with um, taking off. Let me let me skip that because I think the idea was 40 minutes, so I don't want to um, keep people for too long. So I'm not going to do the web uh, thing. Basically, the idea is we can do the same with Hadrian Node. Okay, Hadrian Node produce virtually the same UI graphics. Uh, you as you edit them, you get the Hadrian Node rendered, and you like if you change something in the Chrome editor in the web page, only it's This this was static graphics, right? Mm -hmm. But we can we can do more. We can do animations as well. Um, if I find my thing, um, so here we have a little animation. This is popping down, um, or um, 
this one is kind of a crazy projection. Um, and it's the same deal. The here, that there's a certain starting velocity and so on. If I change that uh, in the code and um, I run it again, then we, we will see the effect when we make the changes. Um, and as a final one, that can even be interactive. So we are not just limited to animation. Not are we not limited to text. We are not limited to graphics. We are not limited to animation. We can even do interactive things. So here I can use So it's really all about being having a more interactive setup and um, <coughs> so that's what we did. Right? We skip the so with the HTML you can see it's the same setup and you get the HTML when I use this one. And um, then I show the but the idea really, the, the core concept is liberating us from the one dimension nature of the web page, making it two dimensional, into a text buffer, and then having this immediate feedback, and having that for not just text, um, but also graphical objects, structures, media like the HTML, and so on. And um, that's me. So thank you very much to, for, for having me. So previously, I'm doing some uh, data and machine learning product development in Kubernetes. So I just want to ask, so let's say uh, if we want to build up a data product, mm -hmm. right, if I want to use Kafka to write some function, mm -hmm. what will be the challenge? Probably I, I give you a more uh, specific scenario. So let's say, okay, uh, now, okay, in this uh, data product, right, we are facing a uh, high volume traffic. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have already built a Kafka, right, to take, take the data and store in some distributed database like uh, Cassandra or Hive. Mm -hmm. So now, let's say we want to write some Kafka uh, Kafka uh, code, right, to execute some function, right. So we let this code uh, call this uh, to call and query the data from the distributed database. For over the net. Right? Yeah. So yeah. what will be the challenge? For for, for example, like uh, uh, what is the latency? Let's say compared to other uh, JVM based language. Um. So that's a very general question. Yeah. 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 Th that's um, a very high level. Yeah. So I, I mean, there there are um, there are quite high performance library Haskell libraries these days for uh, networking and also station passing and all these things you need in a in a network application. And uh, there are also companies out there who um, who use Haskell for data science and so on. Um, but what they so because this is really the first generation people who use Haskell in their environment, a lot of what they are doing is, is homegrown. So one company, for example, I don't know whether you've heard of it, it's probably not a small startup in Sydney, it's called Ambiata, some of our students work there. And um, they are doing a real-time analysis of um, data coming in from, from sales uh, channels, for example, and so on. And, and they, they've really built up their own infrastructure. They do use some established libraries and frameworks, but um, they've also done a lot of um, implementing their own, uh, own frameworks and so on. And basically there are two, fundamentally there are two different things that you can do and that people do do. Um, you, can, you can either uh, build a Haskell layer on something existing uh, like Hadoop or Spark or something. So for example, uh, quite recently, I came across um, this quite nice binding to, to Spark, uh, Haskell binding to Spark, which uh, then allows you to, to run uh, Spark queries and so on. Um, so that's one scenario that you layer Haskell on top of some ex existing JVM based based on infrastructure. Um, or um, if you need something which isn't addressed by these existing tools in, in the way you want it to, um, your own infrastructure, which is what Ambiata is doing. But I think these um, 
Caltex, which are like commercial Caltex uh, from Ambiat and other companies, they have shown that the history tool chain, the compiler, runtime system, the uh, threading system, and so on, is fully capable of working at that scale. Um, but there's there's less uh, ready-made software out there than is in the compiler and that which should be used as well. Okay, thank Does you. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, yeah that's a good answer. Uh, okay, <coughs> so um, uh, on Mac and iPad, uh, on iOS, there's a, um, a library called Spritely, a framework a, a uh, framework called Spritely, which is the amazing game framework. And um, so I wrote a, a test to find in Spritely, which in itself is actually, I think, it's an interesting component. So Spritely is based on an object graph. It's very, it's like, Typical CPU game kind of framework setup where you've got an object class, and the object has different properties and so on, and then that's of a, a computation that happens automatically, but the object class is called user. It's really the kind of uh, setup for testing. So, what I'm doing, I've got a pure first enterprise data type which describes these objects, and it has to change them. It, it does it in the IO monitor. from one version to the next version, they compute the difference of the virtual DOM and then apply that difference to the actual browser DOM. And I'm doing something similar. I'm, uh, I'm computing the difference between the Hesper data structure you bought and the Hesper data structure your transformation updating function produced and apply that difference to the underlying object class user. I mean, that code is horrible. Like, <laughs> it's, it's seen in Hesper syntax. But, um, but the user doesn't What do you think the main difficulties is like for this playground to send parts uh, into the browser environment? Because I'm thinking maybe like for example in the hospital or like website where now <laughs> it comes with a very text simple a simple yeah. text <laughs> repo. If we put a sandbox there and simplify impl uh, implementation there, then we can let the new become newcomer to play with it. And also that it could like if I use the HTML with JavaScript slide, I can <coughs> maybe put an uh, embedded playground mm, while I yeah, presenting yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, you need like AOM graphics. Yes. Yeah. So, um, on one hand, the tech underneath this isn't rocket science, mm -hmm. but I am directly going into PHP API. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not using PHP mod or anything of those libraries because they don't provide all the flexibility. So, I'm coding directly. Um, in this case, I mean, most of this application is actually written in Swift, and um, I'm, uh, I don't know which Windows uh, two years ago I gave a talk at the Haskell Symposium mm -hmm. um, about um, an Objective-C binding for Haskell, where you can write inline Objective-C in Haskell, and that's what I'm using. Mm -hmm. uh, Swift is in Swift and Haskell. Now, in JavaScript or whatever you run in the browser, you case. don't have anything like, yeah. <laughs> but then in PHP.js, you would have to talk to PHP API, and I'm not uh -huh. sure whether they support that. Okay. Um, because, yeah, PHP JS, the idea is to compile everything in Swift in the case I uh -huh. use JavaScript. But I really have to talk to PHP, and uh -huh. you can't compile PHP to JavaScript. So you uh, need yeah. a bridge between JavaScript land and the actual binding PHP implementation. Okay. And to get this rapid feedback, you really you don't want to go to a fast exercise or anything like that. Um, you really want to, yeah, you want to talk directly to the underlying mm -hmm. object type. So that's what I think is the main challenge, is really mm -hmm. very tight coupling to PHP implementation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think okay. the gentleman was I'm new to Haskell. That's um, good. Okay. 
we welcome newcomers. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm going through simulation software, final settlement software, final solution software. Mm -hmm. And I have been using Python now and my agency has computer graphics uh, using, because my agency uses uh, mathematical application. Mm -hmm. So the problem, I'm not gone into graphics edge, so I'm going through, through the breakthrough, through breakthrough of continuous uh, crucible uh, for UI and uh, graphics. So it is uh, for the continuous crucible for site quick application. How, it oh is, how can you compare this uh, breakthroughs and this site? Uh, we, the, the first one I Break, say breakthroughs are continuous. Ah, uh, grave proof. Okay, yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, my mistake. Um, so grave proof. I had this person who used it. I uh, have to say. So it's it's a FRP based, I believe, system, which tries to do graphics from the ground up. And so basically, the idea in grave proof, uh, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, is to do everything from scratch. You start from pixels, and then build it everything up. Which there's this temptation, especially in Hadfield circles, to <coughs> do the, the best, purest, optimal solution and just start from bits and bytes. Problem is, if you start from bits and bytes, instead of using work other people have already done for the last 100 years, then it takes a very long time to get to something a bit more interesting. So the idea here is to leverage an existing industry standard widely used libraries and just put a thin layer on top because then you leverage this existing work. It requires some compromises. Maybe it's not the nicest solution, but it requires a fraction of the work. So the capabilities of something like Spikebit are way beyond something like Grapefruit, but Grapefruit is pure and starting from the ground up. So it's this difference between do you do everything yourself or do you build on other people's <laughs> yeah, this, there are there are two things you showed that uh, remind me of other tests. The first one was a thing called Context Tree Art. Uh, I think it's contexttreeart.org. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the one. And the other one was Sweet. So you talked about making and so you let the people in Smalltalk. Have you yeah. seen that? Okay, I don't know. I mean, it it's not like this kind of thing you would kind of create with like a hack or something. So, so the <coughs> that's a very interesting test. Very, very, very good test. So what, what's the crossover here? I haven't talked about interesting crossover. So there's a long tradition of people, who, who knows Brad Lipka? Brad Lipka, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so if you don't know him, go to jerryhenry.com and watch all his videos because this guy is a genius. And he's been thinking about interaction design and how to, to make programming approachable to a much wider audience for a long time. He's, I, he's made this point about the, you have to, the changes in your code have to be deal with, you have to, you have to get music feedback, and, uh, you have to be able to discover things, explore things, uh, other than going to some stupid PhD and web documentation reading nothing, but in, the, in your code directly. He's made this point for a long time. And in a way, and he in turn has been very strongly influenced by Previous work like Sweet and Dark Emerald Bars, a few uh, uh, famous, uh, also famous interaction designer work which is invented by now, by somebody from now. And um, so this you can see as an attempt to recreate like 1% of the vision of Brad Lipka, uh, maybe 0.5%, so you can do possibly can do much more. So that's the So what's the underlying structure? That's an invisible answer. I can just show it to you. Um, so if I double click on this and say show package content, and then visual for HTML. 